So hello everybody. Uh, my name is Carolina and I work at Saytech as Research and Development Manager. And I would like to welcome you to uh, today's lecture. I believe that most of you already know this, uh, these lectures. However, allow me a brief introduction. Uh, so Life After PhD, or also called Career Cafe Life, has been um, organized since 2018. And it's an event series that aims to showcase PhD holders to, who took various uh, career paths. And it's a great opportunity mainly for young researchers to uh, meet inspiring speakers, listen to their stories, and ask career-related questions. So in, we invite speakers from academia, but also from private sector. And we organize, uh, and newly we organize these uh, lectures in cooperation with uh, Twinning project partners. So it's my pleasure to uh, welcome here also participants outside SATEC. And now I would like to introduce you our guest, Anzer Khan, who is young perspective uh, geneticist and microbiologist. And his uh, story begins in India, where he completed his master degree in uh, molecular genetics. And after his graduation, he uh, followed PhD studies here at Saytech Masek University in Brno. And he became a member also of Saytech PhD student committee, uh, which is active in the improvement in of interdisciplinary cooperation and connects PhD students across uh, CETE consortium. And he was awarded, uh, he has been awarded by many prizes, like best scientific uh, event of 2018 by CETE, but uh, also, for example, by uh, RNA Society Travel Award. He has been involved in uh, many. Uh, uh, volunteer activities uh, related to scientific events, and he also held a position of uh, uh, position as a graduate student representative in RNA Society. And in January 2021, he has started his postdoc in uh, Lausanne in Switzerland, and he was awarded by a prestigious uh, fellowship. And now he is here, and he's willing to share his experience mainly from PhD studies. So I believe it will be very beneficial for you. And um, uh, now I think that I can say that uh, the floor is yours uh, on there. So you can start with your presentation. Yeah, uh, I hope everyone can hear me and see my screen. So, so hello everyone. And I'm really happy to be here to go through my experience at SciTech and what I have learned during my PhD. So I'll be talking all about my PhD journey and some important things which I have learned during my PhD. I will keep this talk very informal and I won't go into science at all. So there won't be any scientific stuff. Sorry for that. So yeah, the first, okay. Yeah. So the first and the foremost and an important thing is that what I have learned in my PhD is that even though we are a PhD students, but we all are not the same. We all have different experiences during our PhD. And I would say I was lucky to finish my PhD on time with good publications. But this is I am talking from my experience and you and someone have someone else can have a completely different opinion and experience. And I would be happy to discuss more during the question answer uh, sessions about things. So when we start our PhD or when a naive master student start their PhD uh, or they are looking for their PhD and when you have to explain your family what actually PhD is, it sometimes get very difficult if they don't know the term, if they don't know what you actually are doing. But I think this illustration really explains PhD in a beautiful way. So let's see, imagine a circle which contains all of human knowledge, everything we know about humanity, everything we know about this world. And then by the time you finish your elementary school, you know a bit more about the world. And so you know something from your elementary schools, then you finish your high school, you know a bit more, then you go for a bachelor's degree and you gain speciality. 
and you start going into specific zones or specific subjects then you by the time you finish your masters you know more about that particular subject about the particular specialty which you have chosen and then if you are interested in your phd you tend to increase your knowledge about that particular subject and by the time you end up on the edge of a human knowledge so the topic you choose by reading research paper by what or whatever topic you have taken for your phd you get onto that edge of a human knowledge where you decide to extend this human knowledge where you decide to do something which will actually extend this knowledge or about the world or about the living system we are studying or anything so when we start our phd we actually focus on this boundary we try to explore this zone what else we can find how can we increase this zone and then we as a phd student we try to push the boundaries for few years we try hard we try hard to get results we try hard to find something contribute to the science and then you made a dent you push this edge a bit and that's your phd is actually so yeah so if you look at the bigger picture what i would say is that we all can be pro, uh, proud as a phd student that we are expanding the knowledge of humanity by working on our research topic though it gets frustrating sometimes but the end it's really fruitful so yeah then i finish i'll i'll finish uh, i finished my masters in 2015 and then i decided for phd a lot of people ask me why phd why are you going for your phd so because phd would give you a professional career for sure uh, especially since i'm interested in academia and so i thought having a phd is the most important thing because you cannot go into academia without a phd and then also i think it's really important because it helps you for your professional uh, personal development also because you get into insight of research methods you meet a lot of people you interact with scientists and my reasons were to get more experience as i told because i want to be in academia i want to have my group in future and with the phd you learn a lot which actually helps throughout your life especially if you don't want to uh, continue in academia so my reason for phd was this and so i'll just explain in few minutes my journey so basically i finished my high school in 2009 then i did a bachelor's in microbiology in uh, finished in 2013 okay yeah so then i did my masters uh, in biotechnology in 2015 then i joined scitech masari university in 2016 january 2016 don't be confused about the subject because i was registered in this particular subject but my whole study was genetics and uh, immunology so i joined in 2016 i finished my phd in october 2020 and i started my postdoc in 2021 at uh, epfl lausanne so this is a, just a short journey of my uh, career how and from where i have come and so when you start your phd uh, uh this is uh, an overview of my phd so the research area was rna editing and its role in drosophila melanogaster i am a drosophila geneticist so yeah then uh, about the research experience and out Put outcome from my PhD. I published six uh, total six publication out of which two were peer reviewed article, first author papers, three reviews, and one first author paper is still in preparation. Hopefully, in few months will be out. And most important, which I think uh, is, I attended more than fifteen conferences all across the globe. I think Mary has a lot of money at that time when I joined as a PhD student. <laughs> so. I was lucky to um, travel twice to US and other places also for my conference and yeah so I think overall I have a really good experience as a PhD student uh, student in SciTech I got a lot of exposure and yeah and then apart from that you also have to look for other um, memberships also because if you want to be in academia you need to be a part of different member uh, societies you get a lot of insight into those society you make your own network you meet people 
So I, I am a part of RNA Society uh, from 2017. Then I also become the part of Genetic Society of America in 2018. And in 2018, I and a couple of my friends, we organize a um, event in SciTech, which was called Eurostempius, which focused on life beyond academia. So we were telling all the PhD students and postdocs what your career options are apart from from being uh, going into academia, and that was awarded as a best scientific event by SciTech. Also took a position of a graduate student representative in RNA Society uh, from 2018 to 19, basically focusing on the graduate students and how to help them, how to develop them, how to develop a mentor-mentee relationship between us, different professors and the students. And I also got a few awards from RNA Society travel awards which helped me to attend the meeting in Krakow and other places. Then uh, apart from doing uh, research, I also did a lot of volunteering and uh, non-research activities. From last four years, we have been organizing a annual event called Euros 10 Peers, which first initiated in SciTech. Then we did it in Berlin and the last two were in online. And these all research, uh, this basically this, uh, in annual event is focused on uh, preparing PhD students for their next phase of life and telling them all the career options they have. This year, we were focusing on uh, science, uh, scientific in leadership uh, position and entrepreneurships. So, and also I organize a lot of retreat for SciTech, um, joint retreat with other institutes. I organize a publishing and editorial process workshop at RNA 2019. I was a finance officer of from 2018 to 2020 in PhD committee of SciTech. And currently also, even I have started my postdoc, I took a career development um, officer's role at a EPFL postdoc committee. So I think it's really good for you to get involved into non-research activities because it actually helps you to network and also get an idea of uh, um, career options apart from academia and to build your network during your PhD and postdoc life. So I'll focus on my uh, PhD, how it was and what things I would recommend people. So the first and the foremost thing, which I think is during your PhD, you need your sidekicks or your PhD peers. And they are really important people in your life, especially for international students like me, because um, when you are an international student who has not been out from their country, who have moved to a new country first in their life, have no idea about anything. So you need people. So first and foremost, the person I met in uh, Bruno was Dragna. Dragna was a, uh, uh, Dragna just started her PhD with Mary and we almost started at the same time, but uh, she made it so easy for me. Is she helped me with almost everything and uh, getting settled and first few weeks I was totally dependent on her then we made uh, then we meet a lot of other people we met Marilena she was an Italian Tapu she, he was an American and bunch of other Indians we were going out every other day and uh, we were hanging out in the city during the weekend and you can see we were going a lot, out a lot initially in the first few years because yeah Come on, you are, you need to enjoy your life too. And uh, then uh, since we formed a, such a good bond that we actually went for a month long trip to India. So uh, a lot of people from SciTech and uh, we, we went to India, we stayed together for a month and actually we developed a really great bond, which I think still exists. And I think it's really important to you to have your PhD peers with you because they can support you emotionally. They can support you a lot during your uh, time when you are frustrated and yeah so that's what i be believe is that you need to have uh, your sidekicks and your peers with you then you need to identify your partners in crime because what happens is that uh, most of your phd life you spend with your colleagues and i got to know such an amazing people who made my life uh, lab life fun so yeah, so these four, especially the V4 were PhD students of Mary. So Dragna, Ketty, and Yirka. And 
uh, we spend almost nine to 10 hours a day together. So it's, uh, you need to have a really good bond with the people whom, with whom you are spending so much time in the lab. And we traveled together. We went to a lot of different conferences together. We were, we were actually helping each other a lot, especially in the lab, because sometimes you need to do finish your um, some important experiments. You need to find people who can actually help you. You need to depend on people. And uh, then again, apart from those, you also need some guidance, some mentorship. And I would be, and I really got a really, uh, and the important person I would say in my PhD was Nagraj. Nagraj was, was a postdoc when I started my PhD in Mary's lab. I had no idea about Drosophila genetics, genetics at all. Nagraj told me everything. I learned a lot from him. And I think you need to find a mentor. You need to find someone who can actually help you during the, your initial phase of your PhD. And then later on you can be independent for the first two years he helped me a lot then he moved and then I, I would say i was completely independent working because whatever he taught me actually helped me a lot even today if i have some doubt or anything i just text him and he replies within a, within 10 minutes or 20 minutes if i need to ask him so you need to have those people in your life and then of course being in an international atmosphere mary comes from scotland and liam also and then we have a, lit a really international atmosphere in the lab we had people from poland italy we had people from uh, australia and other places slovakia and other places too so i think uh, you need to uh, you need to meet people you need to form bond with them and uh, as you're going to spend your 10 hours a day with them. So they are actually your family, second family apart from your family. And then um, work-life balance. It's really important. So I would say you cannot do anything if you don't have a work-life balance. And then you need to find people with whom you can actually enjoy your life. I met these three people, these two. We were roommates for almost five years. They were also PhD students at SciTech. And um, the thing was that we were talking about everything from science to our personal life. We were discussing, there were days where we were just sit and discuss our experiments with each other. They will come up with a solution. Maybe I can try that. Maybe I can do this and I will do the same for them. So I think this is very important. Then the second thing which I found in Bruno, which actually helped me a lot was a cricket team, a sports, which I love a lot. So um, I, I was mostly spending my weekends playing cricket, traveling to different countries, different cities, because I, I love playing cricket. And so essentially what I want to say is don't burn yourself in the lab. Find something which keeps you sane or a bunch of people with whom you love to hang out. Because if you're mentally stable, if you're mentally there, you, you will, things will work for you. And of course, the most and the foremost important thing is your supervisors. Uh, if you don't have good supervisors or if you don't have your support from your supervisors, then PhD lives get really, really frustrating and it becomes a uh, help. And I would say I've been one of the luckiest person to get these two people in my life. They were such an amazing person with whom I've spent my PhD and I have learned a lot from them. So the guidance is very important because when you start as a PhD student, you know basic about the subject you are starting, but you need to know exactly what you have to do. You need to know what steps you to take. You need to have that additional training, which would be required for you for your PhD. Then you need to get this knowledge and the knowledge uh, you get from their experience because they have been working on that particular topic from a long time. They have the connections because if you need something, they can connect you to the people. They can help you to increase, uh, improve your uh, skills, whatever is needed for your project. Then they will keep you on target because they will uh, motivate you also. And ultimately they will help you to grow as a scientist. I think a bond with a supervisor is very important. And if you have a really good bond with your supervisor, you will your PhD life would get really easy. Then you need a good school also. So I think SciTech has been really good. Uh, initially when I um, started my PhD, I had no idea about SciTech for sure, I would say, because 
uh, Sci Tech was a young uh, budding institute, and uh, so but Sci Tech has a really good program, PhD schools, and uh, you uh, learned a lot from your peers because you sit, you together, you talk. We, we have a lot of different journal clubs. I remember Dragna starting one called RNS RNA Club where we were just every weekend we were sitting and we were discussing our science. We, someone was presenting, and then we were commenting. We were helping each other. There's a lot of postgraduate activities and courses from Citex, which actually helps soft skills of a PhD student. Then you have a lot of seminars like this early career information. You have a seminars about funding. And I remember attending a seminar on how to write an EMBO grant, how to write a Marie Curie grant and things. And actually, which helped me to get my own uh, HFSP grant. Then you have a lot of uh, reading sessions, academic and literature discussion, a, a, a really good seminar series, which is uh, in SciTech. And then you have workshops. There's a lot of workshops going around, uh, which actually can help you, which, which can be on your research, which can be on your improving your oral and communication skills. Then we have a lot of networking sessions with uh, people who have already um, made a transition into academia to industry where you meet people you network with them and then campus social life we have a really nice campus social life and i remember me and dragna and others organizing a lot of things for uh, SciTech, especially um, pub quizzes which we used to do every uh, monthly but due to covid it was uh, a stop so i think SciTech has a really uh, great atmosphere with, uh, for phd students and um, uh, you uh, don't you get uh, an idea about everything and it helps you to pre it actually prepares you for your future career options also and then the second part which i want to focus on my presentation is basically about my life post phd or the phase of transition from phd to a postdoc and how we can prepare ourselves and what things i have learned and what I think a PhD student should know and focus uh, should focus on when you are in that particular phase of your life. So basically transition phase, bachelor's, master's, we don't think much, okay, we like this particular topic, we will go for this. But from a PhD to a postdoc uh, transition, you need to think a lot. And this transition phase can be uh like you can explore all the career options and deciding what you want to pursue then you need to build the skills and network needed for career development identify and securing the right postdoctoral position and planning for your career advancement so this all things come step by step but these all things which you need during your transition phase if you have an idea this will really help you a lot so then when you finish your PhD, a lot of people have no idea what are the career path you have, what can career path you can take. So if you, uh, so before you consider even for applying for a postdoctoral position, because a lot of people only think, okay, finish my PhD, I'll go for a postdoc, even if you're not interested in doing science. So I think the best thing is to explore your career options. What can be your career options? What actually best and fits to your interests? goals and values, what actually you want to do, what actually you uh, love to do, and then start thinking about your career advancement early in your PhD training. By the time you are in your second, third year, you should have an idea whether you want to go for a postdoc or not, or you don't want to be a bench scientist, you want to do something else. And then use some of the tools which actually can help you to decide this. And I think developing an individual plan is really important then be very informational uh, information interviews where you meet with experts with different careers and attending this kind of a workshop which actually helps you then meet the career counselors or university training office which actually can help you too and there is a lot about science careers in different journals and a blogs where you can read about it you, you can get a very pretty much a good idea about all the career options and what skills you have and what you would like to do and how you can proceed and advance in that particular career. So as I said, individual development plan is very important. And the first and the most important thing in that plan is your self-assessment. 
look at yourself look and your skills interests and values what skills you have what actually interest you because a lot of people do, don't want to work as uh, on bench but they don't know or they don't have any idea what actually they can do so they just say oh, we'll keep on working and see how does the things work no this shouldn't be the case you should do what you like to do and then you explore all the career options as i said so learn about career options from phd scientists and compare your skills and interests to each other options what you have what you, what skills can you gain if you are interested in that particular uh, career set goals and implement the plan so if you follow this i think it would be really uh, helpful for you in future and then the thing is do you even need a postdoc uh, and the basic answer to this is depending on your career uh, choices you will only need a postdoc if you are going to be an independent investigator a pi or you going to be in an academy and government some government research laboratories or you go into research and development sector in biotech and pharma apart from that you don't need a postdoc if you are interested in journalism communication science communication is booming a lot these days you don't need a postdoc if you go into business biotech startups venture capitalist you don't need a postdoc you don't need a postdoc for science policy patent ip you don't need to so, and so basically doing a postdoc is only a good idea if you are only interested in these three career options whether you want to be a pi whether you want to go to an academy or you want to be into research and development sector in biotech and pharma yeah and as i said many career options do not even require any uh, post doctoral training so as soon as you finish your pa phd you can directly do a transition into a career, completely different career but for sure you have to prepare for that you cannot just finish your phd and do it so if you look at the um, uh, post doctoral opportunity the outside of academia so you don't want to be in academia Sh sure there is a lot of post doc opportunities outside of academia and a lot of different big biotech pharma companies like merck astrazeneca genentech la and all these actually offer you a post doctoral uh, training in their own uh, laboratory and they pay you really well because you won't be paid for as an academic uh, rate of an academic post doc they will be paid for an industrial post doc and then they you will have a lot of different consortiums a lot of different drug discovery uh, where you can uh, actually go for a post doc and you can actually check for uh, the career jobs on their websites because they usually have a post doctoral training program and i think every 6 months they advertise for it so you can apply for it and for sure linkedin is the best place to find a job especially if you are looking for something outside of academia then i think the most important thing during your transition phase is question to yourself question you have to ask yourself is what, what type of work do you want to do and what do you want to learn during your phd that i can actually help you with your career like do you enjoy working at the bench do you like writing teaching helping others is there is something you want to avoid doing like for example some people doesn't want to work on bench don't be a post doc do you prefer being a part of a team do you see yourself as a leader or a manager if you go into these question it will pretty well give you an idea what would you like to do after your post uh, phd and then what in what area sector do you want to do this work whether you want to do this work in an academia whether you want to go into pharma or you want to do this into a government or a non profit organization do you want a stable job or you are comfortable with changing or moving often how do you handle stress and competitive pressure so all these thing actually when you question when you question yourself about all these things you will have a pretty good idea what actually you want to do and then for sure what do you have to offer in terms of expertise skills and ability to get this particular job in which you are interested so again use your individual development plan to ask these and other questions which can actually help you then what are the key skills for career advancement core competencies which we acquired during our phd so conceptual knowledge research skill development rigorous and responsible conduct of research communication skills 
career development and professionalism these are the some very key com core competency that uh, skills that we actually acquired during our phd and wait. yeah and then you access your skills in this domain like for example conceptual and research skill of course you design uh, and develop uh, methods for your experiments you understand complex content you gather and integrate a lot of information by reading a lot of literature you come up with a problem solving uh, ability you actually with uh, as you progress during your phd you get intellectual independence communication and interpersonal skills of course during your phd you work on your written and oral proficiency because you write a lot of papers you write a lot of reviews you give a lot of oral presentation then you listen and understand people around you and understand the science by attending a lot of conferences you convey and complex info to experts and non experts you work collaboratively with colleagues in the lab you thrive in a multidisciplinary environment you develop leadership and conflict management there is a lot of things which you learn during your phd and then there is achievement and self adjustment you learn and adapt quickly you perform under pressure you meet high expectation you start to work independently and you start to take initiative so and then which of these skill do you still need to develop to reach to your future goals because you need to know that's why i said your plan is very important for example if i am interested in science communication i should know what actually i need to work on during my phd or uh, what skills i further need to develop so that i can actually go ahead with that particular career of uh, in future so there's many transfer, uh, transferable skills because what you learn during your phd and a lot of different career options requires almost similar some key skills which will be transferable from one career to another career like what are the the skills needed for a larger job market is for sure you need to have a writing and communication skills you need to have time and project management skills and you need to have people management and teamwork experience so these three things are something some skills which is actually transferable and which is needed for almost every career you take and then you already gain these skills by organizing your exp uh, experiments in the lab we write grants you write paper you work with your others uh, you work with others in the lab so you actually have those skill is just you are not aware of that skills that you have and then you need to know and you need to get opportunities for skill building during phd and i think at this position your phd school uh, comes and plays a very important role because they organize a lot of events for you so and also they organize but you also have to attend those career development workshops then you have to join and engage in professional societies then you have to build and nurture relationship with multiple mentor and uh, sponsors basically you need to talk people you need to talk someone who have actually uh, gone ahead with his career in that particular field you need to network you need to know what skills you need you need to ask them what how can i improve these things so i think this is very important and then you participate in service and leadership activities basically go for and choose opportunities that may meet specific interests or offer a tangible rewards be a leader be take initiative um if you think you are interested in something and your you can organize something which can actually help you or others uh, your peers take initiative talk to your phd school Uh, take uh, um, and organize something which will actually help you too and the most important thing which i have learned during my phd is networking please network everywhere you go because networking helps you to land a job for sure i have during the last 5 years i have known a lot of people who got job just because of networking who have made a transition from one career to another or from post doc to different career just because of networking so networking is really important for your career transition and networking is an essential skill for professional development you need to know how to network you can start networking with your peers and 
you and it can be as important as networking with senior scientists then you you can start with basic basically allow others to learn about you and your research and share by direct conversation or like you go to a conference and just meet someone initiate a talk and it's 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 very easy but sometimes it's for introvert people it gets really difficult but somehow you have to overcome that thing and actually networking can actually lead to a collaboration and new training opportunities for you which will be really helpful for you in future and there are few tips which i can give for uh, networking effectively which i think is helpful be yourself just be yourself don't try to do something idiotic start uh, where you are comfortable through people you already know if you are in a uh, conference try to not be with your people like especially people from your own lab but try to meet people from other lab or someone you already know and then try to mingle and then try to go into a group and talk to people because that's how you start networking and talking to people develop an elevator pitch have two or three lines ready if you if you always uh, struggle to start and uh, uh, in a uh, conversation always have two or three lines written or have with you so that you can actually talk about your interests your backgrounds your goals that can actually start a conversation uh, when you are trying to network with someone be strategic and this is the most important thing in networking if you are going to a conference or if you are going to some particular um, event target individuals or lab where you are interested and where you want to work in future because then you meet those people because in scientific conferences you meet those potential research advisors collaborators and if you are very much interested into them then just go to them talk to them try to try to show them that you are there you know about them you know about their work and you are interested in their work so that in future if you contact them they have basic idea who you are and you might have contacted them be honest and direct sometimes if you need something from someone in a, just go and tell them and talk to them and if you need an advice just go and talk to them follow up and stay connected i during my phd i met a lot of scientists i would say with whom i was really uh, interested in working and i mean i would just email them after reading their new research paper hey i really like your paper and this and this on published in this journal recently and i i was really intrigued and maybe ask a couple of question arising from that paper and actually what i've realized is that they are also take a really keen interest in replying to those conversation so just check in on them just share your updates or if you publish something you just forward them or you just ask them for their guidance so i am writing this what do you think about this or i have found this uh, what do you think about this particular thing i am i have this conclusion for my data uh, do, do you think it's if if that person is working in your field for sure if you send it to someone no they won't understand and then be a resourceful and help others also it cannot be you need to help others also and once you helps other also it will also help you in terms of developing a leadership qualities then the last part which i want to focus on is an academic postdoc career which what i was trying to doing a transition because i always wanted to do a postdoc i all wanted to be in academia so how i prepared i can give you a glimpse of that so basically in future when you um have to be in the job market after you finish your post doc you when you go for a pi position things which actually made you competitive in the academic job market as quality publication for sure people looks for publication then they look look for grants whether you have any grant or you got any grant in during your post doc did you had any teaching experience did you teach someone during your post doc how was your uh, people and money management skill how how are you as a uh, as a leader leader can you lead a group or things like that and then and what i would say is that the many of the skills which we acquire during phd and post doc trainings are transferable to any job inside and outside of academia so 
always engage in training opportunities always that fits your short and long term career goals don't even think oh i have an important experiment i cannot or uh, this is a waste of the time you never know what actually what training can actually help you in future so if you have get a basic uh, training opportunities from your phd school or from your postdoc um management then you just go for it because it will actually help you in future then yeah the main goal of the postdoctoral training which i think is to acquire additional transferable skills and which is technical skills you further get deep into the conceptual knowledge of the subject you are working on you develop more and more communication skills because you publish a lot and then you give a lot of presentations then you get leadership and management skills because as a postdoc you train people you train phd students you train technicians in the lab you you work on your own project and then you also expand your professional network because you need to find a job you need to meet people you need to show the world that you exist and you are looking for a job so you need to expand your professional network too and then as i said a post doctoral research experience should prepare you for the transition of trainee to independent researcher and allow you to develop an independent area of research and expertise which i think that's the main aim of a post doctoral training is if you are not looking to go into an independent research uh, career in academia then or in uh, industry then you shouldn't be thinking about doing a post doc at all yeah and then when you apply for a post doc position yeah so this is from my own experience is that plan and prepare for your post doc search at least a year before you plan to defend so i different i started looking for post doc in october 2019 and i gave my first post doc interview in november 2019 and i was i actually got the post doc position the first ever interview i gave for a post doc position and i got that but i had a lot of time to prepare for uh, in between so what i would suggest is when you are looking for a postdoc position is make contact with the pi with whom you want to work and their lab members especially if you are looking in if you are not sure if you want to work uh, if you are not sure contacting to the pi and how can you contact with the pi is meet the pi or invite them for seminar it to your institute or through the seminar committee i remember when we were i was in scitech every every semester we used to get this email for life science seminar if someone would like to invite some scientists for a, a lecture for a life science seminar lecture so i think with this you can actually take an advantage of this and actually invite someone whom you you really want to meet so that they can come to your uh, campus and give a lecture and you can actually network and talk to them then you schedule a meeting with the pi at a conference so if you are interested in some particular lab and you know that particular pi is coming to that conference you you just email them and talk to and say that oh i'm also attending this conference i saw you are also there would it be okay if we can meet for 10 to 15 minutes and when my own experience i can tell you i have seen a lot of people doing that and i have seen a lot of people being offered a job during a conference just by meeting to the pi giving a short presentation what they are working and because you are meeting to them like directly so they can also see you they can talk to you and things like that then get to know the pi's lab members and alumni because of course you need to know how the person is uh, if you want to work with them and obtain information about success of the potential postdoc pi strain for example this is very important is you should look at how many people from that particular lab has gone on to become a independent pis if uh, if like for example uh, excuse me uh, you are unmute yeah we can't hear you <laughs> okay Ooh. ah it's okay thank you yeah so basically what i was trying to say is that you need to uh, find how successful people has been in working in that particular lab 
go for like if if a pi has trained 15 people uh, throughout his life and all 15 or even 12 or 13 people has gone and went to get an independent pi uh, position then i think that lab has a really good success rate so these things also you have to take in consideration when you are actually looking for uh, um, a postdoc position so because you want the support of the pi also too when you will be applying for a independent fellowship for your own uh, labs yeah and then once you meet with them in a conference or things like that then you be prepared and follow up with the pi have a maybe in few months just a short email exchange about them or the work or remind them that you are really interested and if they have a fellowship or if they have money or you can write a fellowship with them things like that just to be in the touch and show them actually you are eager and you really want to work with them again i says identify fellowship that are suitable and beneficial for you to apply and this is the most important thing a lot of people don't even know that there's a lot of fellowships which you can apply for a postdoc position and they just join the lab and don't even think about applying to a fellowship and when you are looking for a job a lot of um, actually a lot of um, websites can be really helpful i think your access is one of them then nature jobs is really good then phd germany and then scholarship portal and the best i like is linkedin also linkedin you get uh, if you if you are really looking for a job linkedin is one of the best thing to uh, search and also i would say is that even if the the particular pi you are interested in doesn't have a job uh, opening email them ask them because they might really like your cv and they would even hire you even if they don't have a post doctoral funding at that time they will pi try to manage their money pi's will get their money if they really want to hire someone so uh, try to contact the pi and you might get lucky then there's a lot of fellowships long term fellowship which you can apply as a post doc and uh, dip, but yeah this fellowship depends upon where you want to go where you want to work in which country you are going so the most common fellowships which i know as for sure i think most of the people know is embo long term fellowship marie curie fellowship then you have um, hfsp fellowship these are some of the very common fellowships which people apply for their post doc but apart from that depending upon what country you are going you can actually apply for different uh, fellowship like for example i know about uh, in check you have this gachar post doc incoming fellowship which is uh, you can apply if you are coming from outside and uh, work in check and you get a 3 years funding there is a lot of other fellowships and uh, um, eth fellowship is for 2 years in switzerland so depend and then there is fabs uh, fellowship so basically try to um, find the uh, which fellowships you can apply and once you know what fellowships you can apply make a list send it to your potential pi with whom you're going to work and ask them would he would be supporting you to write this fellowship and i think a pi would uh, never minds you writing a fellowship because it actually takes burden from them also because then they won't have to worry about your money uh, because you will get your own independent fellowship and it will actually look good on your cv then just few short tips for building your cv tailor your cv for your specific position to which you are applying highlight your relevant experience skills use terms keyword for job description i remember attending a career uh, symposium in um, uh, san francisco and there there was a, a person from hr and they were saying that when they uh, um, it was from a uh, research industry and they were saying is that when they get the cvs they have only 30 seconds to look at a cv and then they what they do is they only look at the keywords which they want so they have a keywords uh, for that particular job or key research skill they are looking for if you have mentioned that particular keyword or the key research skill on your cv then only they will pass your cv for the next round otherwise they will just discard your cv so look what you are applying for and what actually they need and if you have that skills 
even if you uh, like you need to write those skills if you have those because they are only looking for those particular skills only and then highlight both technical and non uh, and transferable skills you have then format because make is easy for reading include a, include a lot of don't make it like something which is difficult to read so use bold key infos for your titles and things which you really want to highlight on your cv so that people know okay this is what you really want them to focus on use bullet points rather than paragraphs so make it easy and attractive for the user to read then a typical interview for a postdoc so basically um, your initial interview could be via phone or a video and i know it's not possible during covid uh, days but usually a postdoc interview is mostly in person interviews a lot of time where you go to the research lab where you are interested you give give talk you meet with the lab members and if you are visiting that place i think it's also a good idea to meet the postdoctoral of, uh, office representative and you can clear a lot of your doubts especially for people who are moving across the ocean like people moving from eu to us about visa and other issues uh, because you need to know about all other uh, uh, issues which can come during your postdoc apart from just working in the lab and then if it's not possible uh, in person interview is not possible of course people go for zoom these days i gave my interview on zoom and it was 3 days long process because i gave talk to the whole lab then i was meeting five different people from the lab and then i was talking to them individually they were telling me about their research and then we were having discussion so i think it's always a good idea to meet with people from the lab also to get an insight into the lab how the working culture is how the pi is what the pi's expectations are and things like that which can actually help you a lot and you will give a general idea about your uh, future lab then you prepare for the interview that that's the most important thing because i remember mary also complaining a lot when doing a lot of interviews that people come for interviews without even reading her papers so you just go to an interview you have no idea that what lab you are applying for sometimes people just do a copy paste uh, motivation letter where they don't even change uh, things so i think this shouldn't be the case you should always if you are applying uh, or preparing for an, an interview make sure you know the lab really well you read their papers you, and then and then you prepare to answer questions about your work because people will work uh, ask you question about your work and how it fits in with the lab which you are applying why do you think what the skills you have attained or what things you have learned would actually be useful for them so basically the point of the interview is to sell yourself sell as much as you can yourself tell them you are the best you know everything but of course don't oversell yourself but and also be prepared to ask questions and i think most of the pi actually like it when you ask them questions it could be related to their work it could be related to other projects it could be related to their expectations you can even ask them how they can help you i remember asking this question to every postdoc interview i gave i gave three postdoc interviews and i actually asked them how can you help me in my career because of course i'm going to be working in under you but i also i'm looking for my future career advancement i want to be an independent fellow how can you help me uh, in advance what training you will give me and how would you help me to become an independent researcher so i think these question you should or you should never be afraid of asking these things and then of course review university websites for additional training and professional development opportunities and benefits because you need to know a lot of other things uh, apart from just working in the lab so uh, in summary i would like to summarize by saying that start to explore your career options and decide what career works best for you and use your individual development plan and it actually can help you a lot then um, develop the all the relevant transferable skills you need for your desired career choice network network to explore career options and meet your future mentors and advisors in conferences identify and secure a postdoctoral positions that best fit your future goals if you are particularly interested in particular area of research then go for that uh particular uh, area and you don't 
you never should think that if you don't have an expertise in that uh, area, you will not get the postdoc position because molecular biology and a lot of methods always remains the same is the system and a bit changes and you can always learn more thing in your postdoc. And then continue building your transferable skills and use your individual development plan during your postdoc for your future career development. That's my plan is that's what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to learn as much as I can from attending a lot of career workshops and I'm trying to focus on my uh, plan and see how does I can get all I things need for me to make a transition from a postdoc. It's really very early days. I cannot say that I will make it, but that's what I'm trying to do right now. And with that, uh, I think that's all from my side and I would be happy to answer any questions if you have. Uh, wow, uh, it was really, really great presentation. I think that you provide us so many uh, information and concrete tips uh, for networking and how to apply for a postdoc and so on. So I think that it's pity that we don't have more participants here because it was really great. So um, uh, participants, if you have any questions, you can write them to the chat box or ask directly. And uh, at this moment, I just would like to ask you, because you mentioned so many tips for uh, networking during conferences and so on. Do you have any specific tips also for online format? Because it's a bit different, uh, because when you are on conference face to face, it's probably easier to contact somebody. But when it's online, uh, do you have any ideas how to uh, contact some people? Yeah, so I think the thing which I really uh, love these days is contacting PI and being in touch with them on Twitter. Mm -hmm. so I think Twitter is a great tool. I think, trust me, guys, if you are not on Twitter and working in science, you're missing a lot. You meet a lot of people, you meet the scientists you really want to connect and they're always tweeting something you are or you can be commenting on their status. I, I got to know so many scientists. And actually I can tell which probably might help me in securing my funding because a lot of people who were actually part of the review committee of uh, my postdoc grants later I got to know were actually my Twitter connections. So uh, I would say that uh, Twitter is really important for you to showcase uh, yourself in the world of science especially just by tweeting about whatever going in the science community, science field, tweeting about the science, and then just uh, talk to people and uh, be on Twitter. And even if you cannot uh, meet them during, uh, like personally in conferences, a lot of different, uh, like now I think a lot of conferences are coming with the online networking sessions where they make breakout uh, rooms where people just go and talk to each other. So there's a lot of opportunities to talk. It's just you have to find the right way to do it. Perfect. And uh, also, I would like to ask, uh, did you uh, discuss your uh, career options also with your supervisor? Or it was mostly on your ideas, uh, how to continue, who to contact? Or did you ask for some recommendations and tips? Yeah. So basically, I would say in my throughout my period, I only applied for three postdoc positions, and I I got all three postdoc positions. And the first, the first one I applied was in Harvard Medical School, and I got that in November two thousand nineteen, even before writing my thesis. Then I applied to this EPF fellows, and I got it, and one in Oxford. And once I has all these three position, I sat with Liam and Mary. I literally had a really a long conversation every day. And I was literally, I was really in doubt which lab to choose because all three labs were really amazing to work with. And then um, every day we were having discussion about it. And then uh, I was putting my pros and cons with them. And they were telling me what from their experiences. And ultimately I decided to um, move to Switzerland with everything what I have thought throughout. <laughs> so lucky guy. <laughs> uh, so uh, we have a message for, uh, in the chat from uh, Katka Ornerova. She thanks you very much for your lecture. 
and she thinks that uh, also every PhD student should attend <laughs> the, this, um, this uh, lecture and listen to your presentation. And she asks um, if you could uh, pick up the most difficult time issue during your PhD study, if you have any, because it sounds like your PhD stu uh, studies were mostly perfect and very optimistic. So if you have any problematic uh, issue and you can share with us and how do you manage with it? So, I mean, I, it would be not fair to say if I don't, didn't had any problems, everything, everyone has it. So I, I had like a small issue when I started my PhD. Uh, the issue was Mary just moved uh, to SciTech, I think uh, a few months ago. So when I uh, joined the lab, the lab was still setting up and I was so eager to work in the lab that I had, uh, and since you work on Drosophila, we were waiting for a lot of stock. So for first three, four months, I had, I didn't even hold a pipette in my hand. So it was very frustrating for me during that particular phase. I even thought is that, uh, should I continue? Should I not continue? Because I'm not working in the lab and first four months you are not working and you get frustrated and you see your colleagues who are working on cell lines and others are working every day in the lab so it got frustrating a lot but then i think uh, with time and things started working and the other phase which i think is something personal which i would say during my phd i lost my grandma and i was really very close to her and uh, I couldn't travel at that time to be with her. She was struggling with can cancer. And when I got the news uh, about this and yeah, first there were two or three weeks of my life. I would say it was really frustrating. Mm -hmm. And I didn't tell anyone in the lab, neither my friends, no one knew that I was going through that. But I think the best thing is to give time to every problem, whatever you face and time actually heals everything. Uh, also, you, you mentioned many uh, skills you can achieve your, during your PhD studies. Um, do you um, say that some of, or, uh, what do you consider that the, the most important skills you gain uh, during your PhD? What was the, like, the most important? I think um, as, a, as a scientist, I would say my... Uh, intellectual ability for sure has increased. I see things in different ways now. I analyze data properly and is that as a scientist. But what I believe for you to be a successful person or to you to have a transition. And I, I think I focus a lot on this aspect, but I still believe this is the most important part of you, which you think is you should know how to network. Networking is the most important uh, thing in science, actually. You, if because networking puts you in touch with people, could they can put you in touch with recruiters? They can put you in touch with. They can actually help you get collaborations, in, even if you are in academia. So I think meeting people, talking to people, exploring or discussing your science and telling them about your work, your uh, your future career goals, and if you're interested, and they can actually help you a lot by telling you what actually you should do to the ne uh, in the next step of your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm also uh, interesting, uh, interested in what is the role of PhD student who is a member of some RNA society or something like that. What, what does it mean? What do you do for this? Uh, or when you are in membership, something like that. Um, RNA society uh, is one of the biggest societies in science. Um, they have an annual conference every year, which is attended by more than 1500 people. So I attended my first RNA society conference in Prague in 2017. And then my second one in um, Berkeley, California in 2018. 
And so during that, uh, uh, I attended few junior scientist social events. They organize a lot of social events, a lot of career uh, transition or career symposiums. So they had an advertisement about they were looking for a graduate student representative. So I applied for it. So basically, as a graduate student representative, the first and the foremost and the important thing you have to do is uh, it's 70% related to the conference, like annual conference when they organize, they want to have some uh, networking event where people meet the graduate students, the postdocs meet together and they go for a hike, they go for uh, some other uh, things. Like for example, when I organized in Poland, we went to the salt mine in uh, Krakow. And the other thing you have to do is you need to organize a workshop, which actually can help uh, the graduate student to learn more about some aspect of science. So we organized a, a editorial and a publishing workshop to get a graduate student to more insight into how the public publishing house works, what are the editor's jobs are, and then you focus something on the development of graduate students, like if you can help uh, come up with some plan for the society, how can they help graduate student by implementing more and more research travel awards, so you can get input. Also, the thing is that you, can, as a graduate student representative, I am allowed to attend their board meetings. I am allowed to put my points on things. So I think it was a really good experience for me. Okay, sounds great. And um, because we don't have uh, so much time and also some uh, participants already left, I would like to ask who is still here if you have any questions, because I think that it's a unique opportunity for you to, to ask any questions uh, related to PhD studies or postdoc positions. So if you have any questions, please ask them now. <laughs> And um, maybe I have uh, one, uh, one more. So um, uh, I would like to ask you um, about SATEC uh, Student PhD Committee because you were a member of, of it. And basically it's still something new uh, what was established at uh, SATEC. So if you can share some experience uh, with us uh, regarding this uh, activity. Yeah, so SciTech uh, Student Committee, I think it was formed in 2018. I think yeah. me, me, Dragna, and some other of us were the first members of SciTech PhD community. So basically, uh, the committee was formed for uh, to help the PhD students of SciTech to have their voice uh, uh, at the annual uh, meeting of SciTech to talk to the directors, to talk to the chairs, what problems people are facing as a PhD student and SciTech, how SciTech come up with different plans and courses which can actually help PhD students. And also remembering we doing a survey about uh, PhD students, which were actually taken into consideration by SciTech, uh, the points raised in that survey. And we actually also uh, uh, were the one who actually asked for a PhD committee, not uh, like before it was uh, just someone from SciTech being part of the PhD committee, but then, uh, we decided and we asked for someone outside of SciTech also to be the part of a PhD community who can actually yearly monitor student progress and if they have any issues with the supervisors. So I think uh, we did quite a good job initially. I don't know from last two years, how is it going? Okay, yeah, uh, because of the COVID situation, the, the last year was a bit difficult, but uh, we plan a retreat for this autumn. So I think that again, we, uh, we start to do more active and uh, yeah, it will be again, more active this activity as SATEC and uh, students. So we'll see. Hopefully. Okay, so I, I see that we don't have uh, no more questions uh, in chat box, but we have uh, many thanks to you that uh, they enjoyed your talk. And I also agree that it was excellent and very informative for us. 
So uh, thanks a lot. And uh, I'm happy that you were here with us. And maybe next time <laughs> at some other event. Yeah. And um, have a good time at your postdoc. And have a nice wedding. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And see you soon. So thank you. And thank you so much bye. for inviting me. Uh, it was really great. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye and thank you. No worries, thank you so much.